We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. All right. Well, needless to say, I'm thrilled to be here. I truly, truly am. Uh, I'm not much of a table person, but I'll do the table thing because guess what? You know, as in Rome, what do they say? When you're in Rome, do as Romans do. So anyway, I want to thank you very much for uh, inviting me back. I know that uh, Pastor Matt is on sabbatical, so I want to ask you to continue to pray for he and his wife, uh, Melissa, strengthen them, ask God to bless them because sabbaticals are really, really important. They give you a chance to kind of breathe and kind of you know, be rejuvenated and rekindle the fire that's within you. So once again, I want to thank you so much for letting me share some with you. I was recently reading an article about President Abraham Lincoln's death, and uh, it was titled, The Contents of Abraham Lincoln's Pockets on the Evening of His Assassination. Now, I found it pretty interesting when Abraham Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater On April 14th, 1865, he was carrying some things with him. If you were to be caught in that situation, what would they find in your pockets? Think about that for a moment. Some of us might say, (laughs) I don't don't even want to guess. They might find a phone, right? But in his pockets, he was carrying two pairs of spectacles, a lens polisher, a pocket knife, a watch, fob, a white linen handkerchief, a brown leather wallet containing a $5 Confederate note, and eight very worn newspaper clippings positive to the president and his policies. Now, one can only imagine his fierce critics politically. I mean, we've just been through several seasons of politics, and you know how vicious that can be. So they built a, a museum to Abraham Lincoln. And I went through it and with a couple of friends, and I was, was blown away back in 1865 and 18, prior to that, how vicious it was. And so one can only imagine that. And it was known that he was to pull these clippings out and read them continuously to help keep his perspective in light of all the negative and the misinformation. They brought him hope and they brought him comfort in a world that was hostile to him in a world that would take his life. He would have no control over his death, yet he sought comfort through the written words of another. We have no control over our death. We don't know when it's going to occur. Yet I hope you'll carry these words of comfort wherever you go. For whatever reason, if you think about it, the fear of death drives all humanity. It really, really does. If I were to ask you, are you afraid to die? You'd probably say, well, (laughs) I wasn't thinking about doing it today. But yeah, it's a little bit scary. And, And there are those in our world who try to achieve immortality through different means. Some decide, hey, I want to go around God because I'm not so sure. I want to choose God's way of immortality. So I'll choose my own. We were given that choice if you think about it. There's something called... Cryonics, I don't know if you're even familiar with cryonics. Cryonics is the, is the scientific means of freezing someone immediately after they die in hopes that their bodies can be preserved until they find a cure for whatever it was that killed them. And then they could uh, thaw them out <laughs> and fix whatever was wrong so they could have that and continue in life ad infinitum when you think about that. And I thought to myself, my gracious, are you kidding me? There's a much easier way. (laughs) Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Let's choose that. I'm not going to choose freezing. But anyway, that's what some people do. I mean, I hate, I hate when it's cold, don't you? 
But uh, I don't know about you, but I, I wouldn't choose that way. But I was, really in, I was really kind of blown away that people would even consider that. Larry King said, I'll, I'll choose freezing instead of uh, this religion way. Okay. So when you think about those attempts to kind of achieve immortality, I think it's because we are relentlessly driven by the fear of death. We saw that just recently with the, you know, the pandemic, with the COVID pandemic. And people wear masks. They um, have vaccine pushes, booster pushes, social distancing, all in an attempt to keep death from knocking on our door. Yet, Scripture clearly informs us of the reality of death. As a matter of fact, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, explains that. Here, here's what the writer said. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. What do you mean? Well, because the devil can cause you to sin. He can tempt you. And remember, the wages of sin is death. I didn't say that. God did. So God's the one who mandated that. The wages of sin is death. And so therefore, if you sin, you collect your wage. But the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus came to destroy the power of of death and the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. I have watched many people transition into that thing called death. And most of the time, they were very afraid. Most of the time, they were very, very serious. There were those who had a relationship with Jesus who were looking forward to that and anticipating that transition. So I think it depends on where you're at with God. But these verses address a very real subject, and that's the fear of death. We also learn several truths from the scripture. Jesus, God, came, became a man that he might die for all mankind. The only way to destroy Satan, by the way, is to rob him of his weapons, one of them being death. Now, he's got many weapons in his arsenal, but you know, when you think about it, the ultimate weapon is death. You have spiritual death, you have physical death, and you have eternal death. God's already established a spiritual law mandating that sin sin brings forth death. Everyone has sinned, but anyone who has ever sinned will die first spiritually, then physically, then eternally. Death is a reality. Death has become one of the most certain facts of life. Isn't that the truth besides taxes? (laughs) But Satan knew that if mankind would remain as they were, they would die in their sins. They would be separated from God for all eternity. That's what real death is. And you're thinking to yourself, man, this is the first time in church today and you brought me to a sermon like this? I hope if this is your first time, you'll take note. But death is very real. It's separation from the presence of God who is life. Once a person dies physically, the opportunity for salvation is gone forever. Men cannot escape death on their own. They can't. So God had to wrest the power from Satan who had this power over mankind. Once again, he can cause you to sin or tempt you to sin, therefore lead you into that slavery. But God had a more powerful weapon, that being eternal life. And with it, Jesus destroyed death. See, the way to eternal life is through resurrection, but the way to resurrection is through death. So Jesus came to experience death, but before he could be resurrected, he died. And then he was resurrected, thereby thereby giving us life. Jesus is dying, destroyed death. How? Well, because guess what? He walked into death sinless. And when you read Psalm 23, we read it at funerals all the time. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But halfway down through there, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall what? I shall fear no evil. Because see, for him, Jesus' death was just a shadow. So if you're standing on the side of the road and a 19-wheeler came by and the shadow hit you, (laughs) you would say, praise the Lord, it was just the shadow. I wouldn't want to get hit by an 18-wheeler. But see, the shadow of death didn't, didn't phase Jesus because he had no sin. So he walked through death. Remember? Thou shalt fear no evil, for thou, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So guess what? When you go through death, hopefully it'll be nothing more than a mere shadow. Because Jesus will walk with you through the valley of death. And so therefore, he went through it, not being touched by death. 
And he came out on the other side conquering it. I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. Jesus said that over and over. Jesus tells us through the gospel, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. You and I can say as Christ followers like Paul, we can say, for to me, to live is Christ, but to die is what? Is gain. See, we can say with Paul, where, old death, is your victory? Where, old death, is your sting? Death no longer wields any fear for those who have obeyed Jesus. Now, I'm not speaking anything you're not familiar with, hopefully. For those, death simply releases them into the very presence of God. How? Well, because of what? They've placed their souls into the hands of the conqueror of death, Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I know the way to the Father. But there are many who cannot nor accept or will not accept the notion that there is a God. Unfortunately, we live in a world today that people don't believe. But you can't deny it. You, can't try, you can try to avoid it. You can reason it away. But Scripture is very, very clear. The writer of Hebrews once again says this, just as people are destined to die once and after that then to face the judgment. Because God has determined that all people are going to die. We're going to die. We're going to breathe our last one day. He's also determined that all people will face judgment. See, these are realities. Adam and Eve decided to shirk the voice of God in Genesis. And you and I have been attending funerals ever since. Isn't that the truth? See, heaven and hell are real places. So this morning, I would ask you, where will you spend your eternity? Someone asked you to pray with me. Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us this day to talk about important subjects such as this. We pray, Father, that, yes, we might couch it in terms of I'm asking for a friend, but all of us have questions when it comes to eternal realities. We want to know, hey, Lord, is there afterlife? We pray, Father, that you'd open our eyes, open our minds, that we might understand, might see what you'd want us to hear today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, now, just as death is a reality, heaven and hell are realities. And once again, I'm not probably telling you anything you're not familiar with, but hell is not a topic that typically comes up in a public or po polite conversation, <laughs> is it? Hey, I want you to come over tonight. We're going to talk about hell. No. <laughs> There was, there was a bulletin blooper that said something like this. Uh, at evening service tonight, I want to invite you because guess what? The topic, the sermon topic will be, what is hell? Come early and listen to our praise team practice. <laughs> you might want to separate those two phrases. That's as bad as an announcement that says, don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. And that's the truth. <laughs> We can laugh at these things, but you know what? Unfortunately, you know, hell is no laughing matter, but we're familiar with that. According to a recent 2020 poll conducted by Arizona Christian University, 58% of Americans believe in hell. Only 2% believe that they'll end up there. That's interesting. Jesus taught this truth, though. He said, wide is the gate. And broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. See, that's the sad things, guys. We, we as a church need to keep that in mind because guess what? That's why it's so important to do just what we're doing here is help people before they take their last breath. There are people that are on that road, and I don't want to see them. You don't want to see them go that road. But Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate through him. So how does Scripture describe the fate of people who refuse to accept God's free offer of salvation? See, one thing is clear. Jesus taught much about hell and judgment. And he didn't avoid the subject. It's amazing when you, when you do, a research, or do research on that and a, and a, a study on, on words, you'll find out that Jesus taught more about hell and heaven than pretty much any other subject. It's interesting. Listen to just some of his references concerning hell. And I didn't put these on the screen, but I'll just read them real quick for you so that you can get an idea. Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. Now, you and I would say, are you kidding me? He really wants me to do that? Well, he's saying, listen, let me, let me use some provocative verbiage so that you understand how important it is not to let your, your eye lead you to where you shouldn't go. But if your eye causes you to sin... Gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are all horrible descriptions. He says to the Pharisees, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you succeed, you make them twice as much the son of hell as you are. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's not a way to win friends and influence people. I mean, if you tell someone that. But Jesus, being God in the flesh, said, Let me tell you about these eternal realities. He also went to say to them, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being sentenced to hell? See, that verse is reminiscent of something that you'd hear in a courtroom. But Jesus said it. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into chains of darkness to be held for judgment, what about us? So when you hear these things, I don't know about you, but they have a tendency to want to scare the out of you. Hopefully they will. But see, these references, during Jesus' day, the people would have understood what he was talking about when he would use that term hell, which is a Greek word, Gehenna, which meant nothing more than the Valley of Hinnom, which was southwest of Jerusalem. It was a local garbage dump where people threw their garbage. It was burned. It smoldered continuously. It was also a place previously known for child sacrifices from the god of Moloch. So Gehenna was a place associated with evil and refuse. Hell was compared to this and is compared to this. It's a place of evil. It's destitute of all hope. hope and it's because of its everlasting nature. I think Jesus wanted us to, to hear it in terms that were provocative. We live in a day where most people want to dismiss the idea or notion of hell. Isn't that the truth or judgment? I'm just being honest. I mean, I've had lots of conversations about that. <laughs> Pastor, I got a question for you. I'm like, I'm always afraid of those types of questions. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you're going to ask me what type of car I drive? No. <laughs> but no, I want to know about what's your thoughts about this. And I'm like, are, are you ready? Because <laughs> you've asked me. I'm just going to tell you what Scripture says. I'll do my very best to do that. But most people readily accept the notion of heaven. But some want to refuse the idea or concept of hell simply because, guess what? It's offensive. There's a growing number of universities that want to protect students from words or ideas that they don't like. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but there it is. They create these things called safety zones, and they bar certain professors from uttering what could be considered microaggressive speech like, America is the land of opportunity. But hell is certainly a topic that can make one extremely uncomfortable. And perhaps it sounds unfair. I, I get it. Yet Jesus, being God in the flesh, taught us about it. He didn't want us to be ignorant about that. Jesus came from heaven, from the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I want to tell you what he wants me to tell you. He came equipped with infinite wisdom and knowledge compared to our own limited knowledge and moral perceptions. See, being human... Our view of righteousness and fairness can be skewed based on, well, self-interest or what I would consider culture. Most of what Jesus taught was like, you will not get away with living opposite of what God desired to live. Because guess what? He's a father who cares about you, loves you, wants the best for you. Just like you want your children to do the right thing, hopefully. And he was saying there are definite consequences for evil. Jesus said, unless you repent, you too will perish. It's really a challenge to take metaphors and images and make literal sense of them. Isn't that the truth? When you read through Scripture, he uses, or the you know, Spirit of God uses metaphors and, and phraseology that may be a little bit difficult to get our minds, our hearts around, to make literal sense of those things. However, Jesus does a great job. He refers to things like flames, darkness, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. They're descriptive words. And when you think about it, they're metaphor meaning they're nothing more than an image. Because if you take them literal, 
then they would cancel each other out. Flames and darkness do not mix because flames illuminate. So Jesus is obviously saying, hey, I just want you to understand this. He uses terminology and imagery in the, in the book of Revelation. The lake of fire is reserved for Satan and his angels and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophets have been thrown. They'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. See, we, we pick up on that. We understand that. Obviously, it's not a physical fire, but yet a metaphor points toward a reality that it's trying to illustrate. So those terrible images are designed to conjure up a picture of what it's like to be cut off from the very life, the very source of life, the very existence of joy and peace that God has wanted us to participate in. See, separated from God's blessings, his provisions, his love, his compassion, forever. See, darkness evokes aloneness and separateness. Flames depict torment or burning. And the sad thing is when people ask me, Brian, how can a good God send someone to hell? Now, I want you to pick up on that very operative word, send someone to hell. See, God never sends anyone to hell. See, unfortunately, the torment, the pain, the separation is all, unfortunately, self-inflicted. It's because we have resisted God's free offer of salvation and goodness. Each choice that we make in this life moves us closer to our ultimate destination, either toward God or away from God. Whether we want to admit it or not, we set our own moral compass. You say, I don't agree with that. Well, those who reject God reject all that he has for them. And they're making a choice. It's a sad choice, unfortunately. There was a lady in our church. We were very close. We had many conversations. And uh, she came to one and she said, Brian, my brother, he's depressed big time. And um, I said, well, you know what? Try to get him in one of our small groups. Try to get him in our small group. I'd love to have him in our small group. We get a chance to talk about realities of life and think, things like depression and things like, you know, things that we're, we would consider unfair or injustices, we get a chance to talk about those openly. And she said, well, you know, I did that. I said to him, you know, hey, I'm not going to use his name, but he said, I want you to consider this because, you know, you're struggling with this, but I do believe that God has an answer for you, and it's a legitimate answer, and it's probably one you haven't tried before. And he said, honey, I'm a member of Mensa. Have you ever heard of Mensa? Mensa is a high IQ society. He said, I'm a member of Mensa, and I don't believe in fairy tales. And he continued to do his drugs, and a month and a half later, he overdosed and died. And I got to thinking, he was too smart for God, but too naive for the evil one. Because the evil one wants your soul. He really does. Choices matter. See, he went into his eternity the way he chose to enter into it. In his life, he decided, hey, I want nothing to do with God. I'm a member of Mensa. God will honor that decision in your eternity. He truly will. He will not make you spend eternity with him. He will not put your arm behind your back saying, no matter what you do, you're staying with me. Because when you reject him, you reject him. Now, he doesn't want that. His desire is that you be with him. If you want nothing to do with God in the here and now, guess what? You have that desire to live as you desire to live, and God will honor that. Give an example. Jesus tries to explain a parable in Luke chapter 16, an interesting parable. I don't know if you've ever read it before, but I'm going to read it to you real quick. Before he sets the parable up, he says a few things. Jesus said, the Pharisees who loved money heard all these things that Jesus was teaching, and they sneered at Jesus. They looked at him with contempt. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Are you kidding me? But he said to them, hey, listen, you are the ones, <laughs> he points to them, who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. Because see, the Pharisees, the Pharisees also loved money, he said. And they wanted to do with it as they pleased. But yet God said, listen, if you're going to use your resources, use them to help other people. Because he goes on to say, what people value highly in God's sight is detestable. And we have a tendency to do that. We value money, but sometimes... Our use of it is detestable in the eyes of God because we keep it upon ourselves. 
So Jesus goes on to say, listen, let me tell you a story. There was a man who was dressed in purple and in fine linen, and he lived luxury, loved in luxury every day. You can read this for yourself. At his gate was laid a beggar. His name was Lazarus. He was covered with sores, and he was longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. It's interesting. Don't lose sight of that. The angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, Lazarus by his side. So he called, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am tormented in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you can't, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Well, then he answered, Well, then I beg you, Abraham, Father, Send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, well, they have Moses, they have the prophets, they have the word. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, well, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, Jesus may not be teaching about the specifics of hell. However, it's a parable to teach people the ultimate fate of those who, you know, reject God and his desires for their life. The imagery portrays a foretaste of suffering that awaits all those who reject the goodness of God and his way of life for them. Randy Alcorn, he's a Christian author, he says that in this parable, Jesus teaches that in hell we suffer terribly, apparently we're conscious. We retain our desires, our memories for reasoning. We, we long for relief. We cannot be comforted. We cannot leave the torment, and we retain our character. What do you mean retain our character? Yeah, well, the rich man was still self-centered in his demands. He said, send Lazarus to bring me water to cool my tongue. Send Lazarus to preach to my family so they won't end up here. So notice how he's still focused on his own comfort and the safety of his own family. What makes him think that his family will respond to Lazarus? After all, he never did. Like Francis Chan, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, and Preston Sprinkle, they said in their book, Erasing Hell, which is an excellent book if you ever want to read about it, when it comes to hell, we can't afford to be wrong. This is not one of those doctrines you can toss your two cents in, shrug your shoulders, and move on. No, too much is at stake. Too many people are at stake. The Bible has too much to say about it. I have discovered that there is more than just the fear of death in the hearts of people. And that is, there's a desire to live forever. Isn't there? See, there's more than just the fear of hell, but there's the, the desire to live forever with God. Listen to what Solomon said. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the very beginning to end. See, notice eternity is planted in you. It's planted in me. We desire eternity. We seem to long for it. We make statements like this. There's got to be more to this life than this. And there is. I'm so thankful for that. There's got to be more to life than this. Therefore, heaven becomes the one to go to place for all of us. And far more people believe in heaven than they do in hell. Did you know that? Everyone goes there, by the way, when they die, don't we? See, everyone goes there. I mean, how many funerals have you ever attended where that was even a question? <laughs> Why? Because we all want to go there. So-and-so was a good person. Do you know I've rarely met a person, and I have done hundreds of funerals, who was ever considered a bad person. I really haven't. At a funeral, in those memorial services or those celebrations of life, all have been good and all are in a better place. They're all on their way to heaven. But see, that's our limited perspective. We'd like to th think that. We would. Uh, that's not a bad thought. Heaven 
in Scripture is not a figment of our imagination. It's not a feeling. It's not a state of mind. It's not an idea of man. Heaven is a literal place. See, prepared by Jesus Christ for prepared people. And I always say that good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. There's a difference. That's why when Jesus makes statements like this, I go and prepare a place for you. He means it. See, listen again to what he told his disciples. Because some of them would die. They would be martyred for their faith. And he said to them, listen, my, father has, my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I, would I have told you that I'm going to there to prepare a place for you if that was not true? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back, take you to be with me so that where I am, you may also be. I want to go, don't you? By the way, did you know that heaven is mentioned more than 500 times in Scripture? It is. Heaven is real. Baylor University conducted a poll a few years ago that indicates 84% of Americans believe in heaven. Theologian Scott McKnight, professor of New Testament studies, said this, the fleeting satisfactions of this world point us toward a place of final and lasting fulfillment, and I agree with him. See, there's nothing on this earth that satisfies truly. This world reeks of injustice and evil. We've been told that since we were kids. I remember my grandmother saying, Brian, life is not fair. And that's the truth. We see crime, violence plague our land. We see young children trafficked, shot, or abused. We see racial uh, tension. We see all kinds of injustices we long to see a better world. And Jesus promises that. Listen to what he told us through Peter. But in keeping with his promises, we were looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where what? Where righteousness dwells. Praise the Lord. I will be happy. Because guess what? Righteousness does not dwell here. Yeah, in little pockets. Jesus promised a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. See, Jesus told his disciples another truth that pointed to heaven. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, notice the choice being made, believes in him, shall have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. Peter's second letter promises the same thing. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I want to hear those words, don't you? Hey, welcome in, my son, my daughter. This is why Jesus came in the first place, if you think about it. See, Jesus said, I, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because this is the reason I was sent. That's why I came here to share this message. After being baptized in the Jordan, spending some time in the wilderness, remember that? The evil one came to lead him away. But he began to preach, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. The choice is yours. Because see, the kingdom deals with the unseen. Men have a tendency to ignore it, pursue their own agenda, just like you and I have. Yet Jesus and his desire would be that all people would seek his kingdom. Listen to what Jesus said. Listen, seek ye first the kingdom of, and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that the truth? The kingdom of God is God's means of bringing his fallen children into himself, back to his family. But I love this because God doesn't govern his kingdom by coercion or irresistible force. He doesn't do that. No, he governs his kingdom with wisdom and the power of choice. Since we're free moral agents, we're given the free will choice to embrace our creator or reject our creator. God's always given man the choice to do the right thing or the wrong thing. In the Garden of Eden and forward to the days of Joshua, where Joshua confronted those who were rebellious at his time. Here's what Joshua said. Hey, listen, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors that served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my house, <laughs> we're going to serve the Lord. You have a choice to make today. I have a choice to make. God never forces his will on anyone. We're not pawns. We're not robots. Even with the Saul of Tarsus. Here's what Saul said as he told King Agrippa. He was being falsely accused. And he said, listen, King, I chose not to be disobedient to the vision from heaven when God got my attention. Think about it. Jesus always provides a choice. 
to follow him or not, to walk by faith or to walk by sight. You say to yourself, this doesn't make sense to me. Well, guess what? A lot of times it's faith. <laughs> it's not going to make sense. He told his disciples when they were not catching fish. Remember that? Jesus said to Simon, hey, listen, put out into the deep water. Let down your nets for a catch. Peter said, wait, that doesn't make sense. I've been fishing all night. But he did. And he caught a catch. He told the paralytic in John chapter 5, rise up, take up your mat and walk. And he did. He told the blind man in John chapter 9, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. Your sight will be restored. Trust me. And he did. Jesus told the man in the synagogue with a shriveled hand, stretch out your hand. He did. See, God never forces his will on anyone. All of those were open to his leading and his direction. All of these could have decided, hey, I'm not doing this. It doesn't make sense to me. But God has the power and the authority to accomplish his will with men. But he always, always, always gives you the freedom to choose. When you think about it, God commanded the flood waters. Remember that? Flood the earth in Genesis, and they did. He commanded the parting of the Red Sea. Moses, take your staff. Stand back. Watch. He commanded the sun to stand still while Joshua was fighting the Amorite kings. And it stood still. God can call for camp famine. He can send wild beasts. He can send swarming flies. He can send locusts. He can call for pestilence. He can call for plague. He can make a huge fish swallow a prophet. He can cause leaves to die on a fig tree. But God doesn't move men like mountains. He doesn't send them like locusts. He doesn't constrain them like animals. No, he patiently waits and creates the environment for them to choose wisely. It's obvious that there are two distinct realities, kingdoms, spheres, whatever you want to recall it. These two realities continue after this life into the eternal. Listen to the words of Jesus. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people from one from another. A shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he will put the sheep on his right. He will put the goats on his left. That'll be a bad day. Then the king, sorry. <laughs> then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice, hell, or what's referred to as eternal punishment, was not originally designed for mankind. But because certain people decide to choose and follow the evil one, that will be their final destination, unfortunately. Some of my favorite verses concerning heaven, I shared a little bit with you about hell, but I'm going to share some of these about heaven. See, Jesus said, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Whew. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come, share your master's happiness. It is written, no eye has seen, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Wow. For we know that if, we, if this earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, guess what? We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And then lastly, Jesus said, Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. At the death of Lincoln, he was found in his pockets, encouraging words to live by. There were many days that he'd pull those things out, and he'd read through them because it gave him perspective. I hope and pray that this morning that you'll take this with you and that you'll read this to help you deal with the realities of life. Those realities, at least three of them, are life, death, heaven, or hell. Regardless of what your final destination is, you will continue to live. The nature of your final abode will be based on who's paying for your sins. Have you received the free gift of righteousness and forgiveness that Jesus purchased on your behalf on the cross? If so, you've chosen to spend eternity with him. If not, you must pay for your sins. And it's a check that you can't cover. And if that's what you're going to do, you've chosen to spend eternity based on your own assumptions 
separated from him. What happens to us after death all depends on the choices that we make in this life. So I want to encourage you this morning to choose wisely. Choose wisely. Father, we give you thanks for the word of God that's able to save our souls. We pray, Father, that you'd strengthen us and encourage us. Help us to let these words be words of comfort. And may they reinforce what we believe, Father, that you have gone away to prepare a place for us so that where you are, we might be with you. We pray that if there's anyone here today who has not made that decision, we pray that they will make that decision, that they will choose wisely. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.